posted on the ANH website following the session. Second, all of the participants have been muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat function. Let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization you work with. You can access the chat box by clicking chat at the bottom of your Zoom window. We also encourage you to share your webcam video feed if you feel comfortable doing so and do not have bandwidth issues. If your connection gets patchy, we would recommend turning off your video. Later in the session, we'll have an open Q&A. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session, and we'll do our best to raise them during the Q&A. If we have time, we may ask participants to raise their hands um, and you can speak your question aloud. Lastly, if you experience any technical issues throughout the session, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always try to reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link that you used to get here today. If you have a technical question, please feel free to send me a private message in the chat box. Thanks so much. And Dr. Alam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Heli. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammad Jahangir Alam. I'm a professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Marketing at Bangladesh Agricultural University. And also, uh, uh, I was the former director of uh, Institute of Agribusiness and Development Institute. So by training, I'm an agricultural economist. So welcome to this macro level intervention session C. So as you can see the, the presentations that will be basically focusing uh, 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 two different continents. So one in South Asia and another one uh, in Africa. So there will be two, three different presentations and two will basically focus the, the consumer uh, uh, focused presentations and the third one is basically on the producers, but also saying that the macro level interventions such as the agricultural input subsidies, how the agricultural input subsidy complementing with the uh, nutritional intervention brings some uh, impacts on the, uh, the uh, nutrition or the child nutrition and so on. So uh, before going to the presentation, just I want to give uh, some uh, uh, time duration indications for each of the on uh, each of the presentations. So we have three different presenters, uh, and then they will basically reintroduce their uh, presentations uh, by three minutes each. So uh, for the uh, participants, you might already seen the presentations and abstracts and the the video clip from uh, on the NH uh, website. So. Before going to the presentation, I would like to introduce the speakers. Uh, so our first speaker will be Hogu Da Grothe. Uh, he is a research scientist at International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. And then our second presenter uh, is Martin Mawale. Uh, he is a PhD student at University of Stellenbosch uh, in South Africa. And then our third and last presenter is uh, Suruti Sairiak. Uh, she is from. Emory University in US. So uh, before uh, going to the each of the speakers, uh, just uh, I want to, uh, to to mention some of the, the the issues on the first presenters. So it's Grutu, Hugo De Grote. He is going to present on measuring consumers' acceptance and willingness to pay for instant uh, fortified palm millet products, Dakar, Senegal. So this study is basically interviewed 296 randomly selected consumers, men and women, uh, participated all from Dhaka, Senegal. The major products straight under evaluation were instant versus conventionally cooked cereal, shifted versus whole cereal, uh, and fortification from a commercial premix versus food to food fortification. Uh, the study find that effective taste with Coke products uh, uh, to determine consumer acceptance and finally participated in the economic experiment to determine their willingness to pay that what they, he used, uh, they used the experimental auction method. And to estimate the effect of information on the content of the product on willingness to pay, the auctions were conducted either uh, with and without uh, that information. That the study finds that consumer did not distinguish between instant and conventional flour, uh, and also find that experimental auction showed no differences in willingness to pay for the different trades without information. 
However, analysis with pool data showed a strong information effects on willingness to pay for different trades. So give, having said that, just I want to, to welcome to Hogode Grete to give his three minutes uh, uh, reintroduction presentations uh, on his work. So it's now back to you, Hugo Grete. Thank you very much, Dr. Alam. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can, can you see my screen? Yes, I can yeah. see. Okay, so you have already given the introduction. Uh, I just want to show you, this is a small extruder here on, in the picture, which uh, only costs a few thousand dollars, and that can be uh, used by small enterprises to make instant food, and that instant food can easily be fortified with either premix or food-to-food -food, um, uh, fortification. So, we did, uh, before we, we bring those products to the market, we want to see if the consumer likes them, and then if the consumer uh, is willing to pay the cost of those products, particularly uh, instant at the standard cost at five different products. This is the design. People first uh, do the sensory evaluation, then they were split in two groups to do the willingness to pay, first without information, then with information, while the second group went straight into the information. Sorry, you excuse me to interrupt. Your, if you could just enter presenter view, please, on the slides. On the slide, presenter yes. view. Yeah, we're, we're just seeing um, uh, a PowerPoint um, you know, window. If you enter into slideshow mode. Yes, is this fine? No, so no. We're if you just want to click into the presenter slideshow view of the PowerPoint. Yes. I, I did that and for me it shows the slides. Um, can you change the presenter um, view on the top to we are seeing um, not presenter view. Um no. So it said you you are screen sharing and on my I have two screens. One does the the full screen and the other does the the PowerPoint special screen. Did you do a uh, did you do the uh, slide show? Could you click yeah. on that TV thingy downstairs down here? Yeah, I, I did that. Yeah, okay. Maybe just go ahead then. It's fine. Yeah. So you just see know that we are only in, we don't have the, the full uh, slideshow. We just have it when you just first open with all the slides to the left and that sort of thing. Yeah. You, you don't see individual slides? No, we do not see individual. So you'll want uh, to, maybe in this, you could try to change the view on. Oh, hi, presenter view. Does this help? Um, I'm not sure yet. Give it a try. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yes, yes, that's perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, yes, yes. Actually, there was nothing important yet. Uh, I'm coming to the results here. Yeah, this is the hint. Good, we come to the important point. So this is a sensory evaluation where we, the five products on the left is sifted to the most right, the darker is instant with premix and food to food. And you can see that the traditional uh, sifted flour for, of uh, millet for porridge is most appreciated. None of the new products get the same score, especially the premix which has a metallic taste and darkens the color, is not appreciated, uh, while instant is not really significantly different. We did the statistical analysis. I won't go through the details. It shows just which ones are significantly different. Then we asked consumers uh, how much they're willing to pay for the different 
products. So without or with information. And these are the results. Uh, you can see that um, the top is without information. There is no statistical difference between, um, between the, different, the different products because the, even though the, the evaluation was different, it did not translate in a difference of willingness to pay. Now the blue is the first group after they're given the information which products contain what. You can clearly see the food to food fortification get a much higher willingness to pay followed by the one with the premix. So even they did not like the taste of the premix, once they were told this is improved nutritional quality, quality willingness to pay increases. The last group who went straight from tasting to information and willingness to pay, you can see here the whole product is not a, gets a lower willingness to pay than the basic product because consumers in Senegal uh, do not usually like the whole product, while the food to food fortification gets a higher willingness to pay. Then we also compared the, sorry, this is statistical analysis. I will skip that one. Um, and then we compared the different, uh, how much does it cost to make the product? That's the colored bars and compare it to the willingness to pay the orange bar. So you can see for the first four products, the willingness to pay is higher than the cost of production. Um, especially for the first one that has the highest uh, profit. While for the last one, the food to food fortification, the cost is much higher than the willingness to pay. Basically because we were trying to get a certain level of vitamin A and iron and to get that from natural sources was quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, people can taste the difference, but it did not really translate into a change in willingness to pay. But once they were given the information, a willingness to pay of a quality food increased, but for whole, food, whole flour decreased. Still, the product we wanted to develop where um, fortification would come from natural sources is, was, was at that stage too expensive. Since then, this was a few years back, we have now developed new products and improved the mix and uh, we were hoping this month to start with the uh, commercial testing, but that's now postponed till October. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hugo de Grotto. You took like uh, one extra minute it's because of these technical <laughs> difficulties. Uh, but uh, thank, thank you so much for your very nice presentation. Now just uh, we want to move to the, our second presentation. It's uh, Martin Mawali. As I said that Martin is a PhD student at University of Stellen Bosch. He, he is from basically Malawi. So he is talking on the complementary effects of farm input uh, subsidies and good healthcare quality on child nutrition in Malawi. So in this study, they estimated uh, the, uh, both homogeneous and heterogeneous relationship between child nutrition and the programs. For example, farm input subsidy programs focused antenatal care programs and community-based under five nutrition program. The study find that the Malawi farm input subsidy program positively and significantly relates to long-term child nutrition only when complemented with good maternal health care quality. This aggregation by age of the child reveals that only child, uh, children under the age three benefits much from this complementary relationship through increased mother's exposure to uh, uh, focused antenatal care program during the prenatal period. So it's a very good study it's combining the agricultural input subsidies and the, uh, the, the, the antenatal care program. So it's now over to you. Martin, you are welcome. And then you will be given three minutes for a reintroduction of your award. So it's over to you, Martin. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Alam. All right, so we are- Martin, Martin uh, if you yeah. just want to switch your display settings, we're seeing the notes um, okay. view. Okay, I, sh I should switch on there. So just click display settings at the top left of your screen in the middle there. Okay, display settings, yes. And then switch the 
swap presenter and slide show that first one okay like that yes there you go great all right okay thank you very much all right in this in this study, we, were, we, we are trying to understand the complementary effects between the farm input subsidy vouchers and good healthy care in trying to induce improved child nutrition, particularly high for age. All right, so just in very brief, the farm input subsidies, they are very famous in Sub-Sahara. This is where farmers are provided with vouchers, which can enable them to obtain inputs at a, at a reduced market price. They pay less than the market price given the vouchers. So these subsidies, when they get into the household, they have shown to improve productivity, serial productivity. But what is li little is known about their impacts on the other non-crop non, uh, non outcomes. For instance, food security, particularly on child nutrition. There are two studies which have been conducted in this literature. The one which is one with Halu 2018 and Karamba 2013. And they find that households which received the vouchers for farming subsidies, they experienced improvement in weight for age and weight for height. And they don't see any improvement with respect to height for age. So this study goes for the height for age and sees what other mechanisms can help the farming for subsidies to positively shock height for age. So the objective is to estimate the complementarity between the Malawi Farm Input Subsidy Voucher and a program and the healthy care quality in improving child nutrition. We chose Malawi because it was the pioneer country in Sub-Sahara to reintroduce these subsidies since their abolishment under structure adjustment programs. So the main method which we want to, to use here, we want to see if, the, if a household receives a Farm Input Subsidy Voucher and the mother during pregnancy was exposed to focused continental care model, which is a minimum, of, a recommended minimum of four visits during the, uh, the first trimester of the pregnancy. And after birth, if the child participates in nutrition programs, which is particularly most for children above the age of three who participated in these programs, a combination of these three interventions, do they bring different results from what we see in the literature? That's the question which we are studying from this study. We are using two data sets. The first is the Living Standards Measurement Survey, a panel data set. And then we are, we are using the Service Provision Assessment. For the Service Provision Assessment, we obtain information on the focused antenatal care participation. While for the Living Standard Measurement Survey, that's where we get the subsidies information and the information on the participation of child in nutrition programs and information on height for age for the child. We find that Long-term child nutrition, which in this case we are referring to height for age, improves only when there's good health care quality in place. This is what the previous studies couldn't uncover. They just showed that there's no relationship between the subsidies and height, uh, height for age. And we are saying there is a relationship only when good health care is in place. So the effects are heterogeneous. For children who are under the age of three, once the mother during pregnancy was exposed to focused antenatal care and they received the farm input subsidy voucher, height for age improves. While for children who are above the age of three, just having the mother exposure through pregnancy and the farm input subsidy doesn't improve. But when you expose the child as, an, uh, as a grown up child into participation into the, uh, the nutrition initiatives, then the child, child's height for age positive response. So that's what the study is particularly trying to find. We- Martin, Martin just please uh, uh, finish within the time, please. Uh, all right, okay. Yes, so the study does this by measuring heterogeneous effects. While the previous studies measured homogeneous effect, the relationship between the subsidy and high for age. For us, we want to combine the, the subsidy and the focus on dental care and the subsidy and participation in nutrition. And we do another level, which is the equation number three, combining all the three program, programs and see high height for age response. So the results show that the farm input subsidy together with the focus mother's exposure to focus on dental care positively improve, improves height for age by 0 0.897 standard deviations. And for those who are under the age of three, that combination is enough. But for those who, children above the age of three, 
you also need the child to be participating in a community nutrition program. So we find the robustness of these results using an alternative methods, instrumental variables, and the reliable instrumental variable, which uses heteroselasticity to identify the effects of interest, and the results remaining qualitatively the same. Therefore, the liquidity improvement through farm input subsidy programs, which is, may, may, might help households to access market, access to foods, nutrition, diets. But it improves sight for age only when there's also investment from the healthcare side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin Mawale, for your very nice presentations. I understand that it's very, really very difficult to finish everything in three minutes time, but you also took a minute, one or two minutes more. Uh, now we are uh, moving from Africa to South Asia. So it's our last uh, presentations. Uh, uh, Shuruti Saidia can she will be giving a presentation on understanding the drivers of high coverage and low utilization of double fortified salt in Uttar Pradesh, India. Insights from a mixed method study. In this study, this, the, she selected five out of ten double fortified salt intervention districts and then applied uh, mixed methods to assess implementation, fidelity, coverage, and utilization of the double fortified salt, and examined pathways through which utilization occurred. Uh, they conduct, she conducted uh, 23 in-depth interviews with caregivers to understand the DFS utilizations and associated regions for each partial use and non-use. In addition, that by using the historified random sampling approach, she conducted surveys in urban and rural clusters with 1,202 uh, public distribution system cardholders households. The study finds coverage was high with 89% survey respondents having seen or heard of double fortified salt, 80% having purchased it at least once and 75% typically purchasing DFS with PDS rations. However, several DFS users noted changes in taste and food color. So they said that our curry turns dark in color. Even our utensil become black and the taste is different. So giving said that it's about to use idea. So just uh, please try to maintain three in three minutes. So just over to you, please. All right, thank you, Dr. Alam, for nicely summarizing. You've made my job easier. Um, this is actually my dissertation research um, done on the process evaluation in Uttar Pradesh, India, on this double fortified salt program. Uh, this was a study led by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Um, DFS or double fortified salt is salt that's fortified with iron and iodine and Uttar Pradesh recently introduced it as a pilot intervention in the 10 districts that you see on the map. The program was implemented through the public distribution system or PDS. The PDS contained a widespread network of shops such as the one you see here. Uh, which provided subsidized rice, wheat, and kerosene to eligible households every month. In the 10 intervention districts that I showed in the last slide, DFS was added to the PDS commodity basket and was priced to be cheaper than the iodized salt available in retail markets. We selected five districts for our evaluation and adopted a mixed methods approach using both surveys as well as in-depth interviews. Moving on to the results, we found that overall the program had good coverage. Most households had heard of or purchased to DFS, but adherence was low with only 23% households reporting complete adherence where DFS was utilized in all food salt requirements. We also noted that rural areas had better coverage and adherence than urban areas. The in-depth interviews we did with DFS, care, uh, with DFS users helped us understand the reasons for the high purchase but low utilization. 
caregivers reported that PDS shopkeepers often bundled DFS sale with rice and wheat. So if households wanted subsidized grains, they also had to purchase DFS. While this did increase DFS purchase rates, usage was still low. And this was perhaps because caregivers noted organoleptic changes, such as food discoloration, after cooking with DFS. Some caregivers therefore discontinued DFS use, while others adopted strategies to mask their discoloration. For instance, this one caregiver said, we add more turmeric so that it hides the blackness of salt. In summary, to increase and sustain adherence, long-term investments must be made to, uh, to improve product quality and avoid food discoloration. As for the short term, our qualitative data shows that some caregivers who are aware of DFS benefits adopted mitigation strategies to overcome the discoloration. So reinforcing the messaging around safety and benefits of the product, in addition to proactively informing them about discoloration might be an interim solution. Um, additionally, for sustaining high program coverage in urban areas, fewer, where fewer households uh, regularly access the PDS, an alternate distribution strategy through retail markets may be worth considering as the program scales up. Um, thank you, and I want to acknowledge the research team at Gain and Emory University um, that were part of this research. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saruthi Sairia, just be in time. Uh, so. Yeah, we just finished all the presentations right now, and then our plan is to move uh, to Q and A. So it's my plan is that uh, I will take a couple of questions and go for several rounds. So uh, the 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 participants you can put your comments or any questions on the chat box. So I'll take and then we'll go one by one. So uh, now uh, over to the uh, participants. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, w would you like me to answer the questions? It was too directed at me. Uh, yes, yeah, just I'm going to read the questions from here. Okay. So, I don't, uh, so you are seeing the questions in the screen? Do you see that? I think he's referring to the ones in the chat box, but Dr. Alam, you can go ahead and read out those questions that are in the the Google document. Uh, okay. So uh, it's one of the participants is uh, Bonali Papula and Clement uh, Ogokhantle. Uh, so the question is, uh, how did you measure consumer acceptance and other parameters that are subjective among study participants is for Hugo. So yeah, Hugo, you could reply to this question. I'm not quite getting the question because all, all the parameters are subjective. We're asking people how do things taste, what are their willingness to pay. That's, those are all subjective indicators of consumer appreciation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then I uh, move to Suruti Sairia. The question is that you spoke about the color changes that people noticed in the user experience of DFS. I am interested to know whether people noticed any differences in taste also. It's about to Saria. Thank you for that question. Um, in general, we noted that most people um, only spoke about color. Some caregivers did talk about taste, but they said that that perception could be because they find the food to be dark and that sort of affects their perception about taste and um, there's not necessarily a change in the taste. Okay, thank you, Saria. So you have one more question is from Ariu Wallasoyan. I'm very sorry if it is not correctly spelled, uh, pronounced. Is there any behavior change communication component in the, in the introduction of DFS? It's about to sell here. Right. Um, so yes, the program did think about a behavior change component. Um, they actually trained the PDS shopkeepers to communicate about the DFS product and about the benefits of it. 
they also had um, perhaps as an afterthought in um, they involved all the community health workers to go out to the households and explain how to use DFS, when to add uh, the salt to the food, etc. Um, but this was not in a structured format, so um, it was not as effective as anticipated. Thank you. Thank you, Suruti. So I see another question. So its name is not given, but the question is uh, to Martin. Could you please articulate what kind of healthcare quality you found to be important? A super important and interesting study. That's basically the comments. The question is, could you please articulate what kind of healthcare quality you found to be important? It's to All Martin. Right. All right, thank, thank you very much, Sunita. So in, the, in, this, in the study, we used two indicators for healthcare care quality. The first was uh, focused antenatal care. This is in this case, um, we were measuring the, we, we, we captured geographical distance between the household in which the child existed to the nearest health facility. And then we measured, we, we, we captured the, the facility and then see if inside this facility, they administer the focused antenatal care model. So there are other facilities which do not, and there are other facilities which do administer it. So if the facility, so, so we'd see the distance between the, where the, house, the household where the child is and this facility which is providing the focused antenatal care to determine the exposure of the focused antenatal care. Well, for the other health indicator, which is whether the child is participating in a nutrition program, the questionnaire directly asked, does this child participation in a community-based uh, nutrition pro initiative? And then they would answer to say no or yes. And uh, those are the two health indicators that we used in the study. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's uh, to Hugo de Grote. So it's uh, from uh, Bolane Popula. So how did you Hugo de Grote measure consumer's acceptance? It's to Hugo de Grote. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to share my screen. Did, did that work? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Uh, so basically, um, we, we had here five uh, cooked products, um, 25 grams here cooked and presented in cups for tasting and they were labeled just with symbols. So the participants, they could just taste and then they score on a five point scale from dislike very much to like very much on uh, five different uh, attributes, uh, taste, appearance, um, aroma, um, texture in the hand, texture in the mouth, and then overall. Mm -hmm. And then the analysis was just an, first an average score, and then we used uh, ordinal regression to analyze that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hugo de Grote. So can you please swipe your uh, uh, PowerPoint from the screen? Uh, I sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the other question is from Clement Ogun Kuntle. So it's again to Hugo de Grote. How did Hugo de Grote manage to measure parameters that are subjective among the study groups? Yeah, I, again, I'm not quite getting the question since all the parameters are subjective. We just try to put them in, in a scale, a one to five Likert scale for the um, uh, sensory evaluation and in a quantitative willingness to pay scale from, from the experiments. But these are all subjective uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, from Sunita Kadiali, Suruti, it's to Suruti. One would presume that such acceptability test would be done before distributing it so widely at that scale, correct? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, Sunita, thank you for that question. Um, 
The program actually did do some consumer acceptability studies, but um, this was done in New Delhi um, and not in Uttar Pradesh. So it was a different state, a different context. Um, so the population there was different. Um, from different population, though they saw slight discoloration, um, they were willing to um, still use DFS. Whereas in UP, um, the context was completely different, and not everybody had full awareness about the benefits of the product and had questions about the safety of the product as well. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Saruti. So it's now to Martin Mawale. What did you originally hypothesis uh, would be the pathway to impact of the subsidy component? This is the first question. And the second one is, did you want to improve household consumption or to improve household income and purchasing power? It's to Martin, please. All right. Thank you very much, Hali. Okay, the, the main hypothesis was uh, the improvement in, uh, in, in purchasing power. We want uh, the, the subsidy, once it comes into the household, we understand there could be improvement in consumption. But we are, we are, account, we are mind if, mindful that uh, this consumption is city of consumption, which may not be so much important in the nutrition value uh, for the consumption of the children, that is. So we are looking at the, the purchasing power, that if they are consuming their own food and they are not purchasing uh, food from the market, some income would be saved on one hand. On the other hand, they'll also income also be saved because they are no longer using their own income to purchase uh, a full priced market of the, of the, of the impost, that is. So the, the improvement in liquidity can be used to purchase now market accessed nutrition, nutritious diets. So the main transmission mechanism was the purchasing power, which is the second part of the question which you have put forward. Not necessarily the consumption. We understand consumption would improve, but then cereals are not really good at improving nutrition relative to other crops. So the liquidity is the main transmission mechanism, the purchasing power, thanks. Thank you, Martin. Now we move to Suroti again. Uh, it's a question from Ariu Oliwasion. So what he asks that, uh, is there any behavioral change communication component in the introduction of double fortified salt? It's to Suroti, sorry. Yeah, hi, Dr. Alam. I thought I answered that question earlier about um, there already being a component. They had trained the PDS shopkeepers to give some communication and also eventually roped in the community health workers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, and now move to Martin again. Uh, it's a question from Sunita. Martin, could you please articulate what kind of healthcare quality you found to be important? Oh, so, sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I thought I answered. That I answered. was also answered. I think there was some confusion going on with the Google sheet and the. Okay. Okay. Yes, I can see it's basically the answered question is red colored, but I don't see any red color in this question. Uh -huh. So okay. could you please control that question? Okay. So like, should I come again on the. No, no, I... it's, it's fine. I got that question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's uh, from another question from Sunita again. In general, what do you know about willingness to pay and actual eventual behaviors? That is how strongly do willingness to pay results predict practices? It's to Martin. It's to Hugo, sorry, that's Oh, sorry. Me. Yeah, yeah, it's not written here. It's to oh. Hugo, yeah. yeah, Hugo. No problem, yeah. Thank to you. be honest, we, we do not know. I've been doing this kind of studies for the last 10 years, but I've never had the chance to actually put the same product into the market or, or the, for, for other reasons, the product did not get to the market. We hope this year to bring the, the product in Dakar to the market and, and then I could, I could make a comparison. So, but as far as I know, it's only uh, Vivian Hoffman who had done some preliminary uh, trials and then um, and then put the product in the market, and she found there was quite quite a discrepancy between the two. 
So I would interpre interpret the results more like this is a relative comparing willingness to pay for different products, but definitely not, not absolute as we only offering one product in a fairly small, sorry, one unit of a fairly small quantity to the consumer. We're not looking at how that um, demand evolves over time. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Now I just want to move to Martin. So it's Martin, a uh, question, could you expand on the nutritional element of the program? What exactly is given to children who are participating? How well was this implemented? All right, thank you Mr. very much. Mr. Martin. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, the, the, the nutrition initiative, which is uh, administered to, to children, it's administered to children, especially those who are above the age of three. So these children, they go into community-based childcare centers. And in these centers, they are provided with, uh, with nutrition rations. And these, these, they are employed, uh, employed individuals who work in these centers. Not, the, not, their, not their parents. Their parents only drop them off and then they will take them back, let's say like in the evening. But the kind of uh, food which is provided is funded by the community. But the expertise to prepare the food and, or the type of food which should be bought uh, is they are trained by the government. So that's the initiative. Okay, thank you, Martin. It's now to Hugo de Grote. What sort of information was given to people about the fortified products? Your results seem to suggest that micronutrients and health benefits are important to people in Dhaka. How could awareness of fortified products be effectively communicated and who should do this in the interest of trust and transparency? Yes, so what we did after the people have tasted the products which were labeled with, with symbols, we then told them, sorry, the enumerators told individually to the participant, uh, this product is instant, this one is not. This product has uh, added uh, for, uh, vitamin A, iron and zinc. This one is from the premix. That one is from uh, from natural uh, products. That was baobab, and I think ca carrot powder. So we told them that one. We did not give any um, information or what are the benefits of the micronutrients. We did not do that. We did explain that an instant product is like instant coffee. You only have to boil water, and you gain time and uh, energy. So it was just. Uh, maybe a five minute uh, presentation of the content of, of the five products. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo de Grote. Oh, sorry, now, the, the, the content was also written on the packages that were, when we did the with information, the content was also written on the label of the product. And they were given time to ask questions. Okay, thank you, Hugo de Grote. Now over to, Suruti Sairiyar, given the sensory characteristics and quality difficulties with this kind of fortification, how do you think a supplementation program is still using the fair price shops as the distribution mechanism would compare in effectiveness? Is to Suruti Sairiyar. I wanted to clarify that question. Uh, do they mean supplementation program using the PDS? Oh, no, it said that I read again. Given the sensor, sensory characteristics and quality difficulties with this kind of fortification, how do you think a supplementation program is still using the fair price shops as the distribution mechanism would compare the effectiveness. So it's about talking on the effectiveness of that program. Mm -hmm. um, right, so I mean, uh, this, this evaluation, the process evaluation that we did, it, it's only one part of a larger evaluation for the DFS program. 
So we are also doing impact evaluation assessments and the results for that are um, you know, uh, forthcoming, but we do see a small effect uh, in reducing anemia prevalence and improving iron uh, status among those who were actually consuming DFS. Um, but given the sensory issues, it is a valid concern that most people will have difficulties accepting DFS readily unless some quality changes are made in the premix. Um, so given that context, um, supplementation um, could be a good substitution or could be a simultaneous program that can be implemented. However, in India, supplements, um, iron and folic acid supplements are distributed through the health systems network. And um, there have been historically a lot of problems with that in terms of the supply chain as well as adherence to the iron and folic acid tablets. So um, personally, I don't think it's one way or the other. We we'll need to see how um, different contexts might accept different strategies differently. Thank you, Saroti Syriac. Uh, one more question to you. How confident are you that this could be a widely accepted program moving forward? Would this be the most cost effective? Again, it's saying about the effective cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, salt, everybody consumes salt. So fortifying salt um, uh, seems like a good strategy on paper because if everybody consumes it, then the iron is going into their system. Um, iodized salt has had historical success in India, and that has sort of motivated them to consider adding iron also to the salt. So if everything, um, if acceptability was not a concern, then this would be a cost effective um, strategy to address iron deficiency. However, there is a problem with the sensory issues and that needs to be corrected. So um, the recommendation, as I said in my summary slide, is that we need to go back to the drawing bo board and see how the premix quality can be addressed and how the discoloration can be addressed first. Thank you. Thank you, Surati Sariak. Now uh, to Martin. So what is the availability of diverse foods in the market uh, in that uh, in your research context? It's to Martin. Sorry, may you just repeat? Uh, yeah, what is the availability of diverse foods in the market in your research context? I, it's written that in this context, but I'm saying that in your context. Oh, okay. It's avail right. availability of diverse foods in the market. I would say the, okay, I would say this the diverse food is available in the market. But for me to give maybe like an exact exact extent to say this is the level, I may not be able to directly say this is the level at which the food is available, but the food is available in the market. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Ali, I don't see the Excel file. Um, one moment, I can resend it to you. Ah, uh, yes, now I can see it. Yeah. So, mm, yes, again, uh, Martin, so it's to you. Given that the subsidies are not effective at improving uh, it's uh, high for age when used alone. Do you think this should be prioritized moving forwards? Is this a cost effective solution or should we improve other components of the intervention such as the nutrition element? This oh, to Martin. All right. Um, I would say, okay, I would say that the best we can do with the subsidies in this case is to take advantage of the of what they can contribute to, to, to hide for age. But it would be very difficult to completely change the way the subsidy is implemented so that we should focus nutrition. For instance, may, maybe let's say, okay, let if 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 we want to this subsidy to help you hide for age, let's let's say subsidize legumes. That shift can be difficult because this the nutrition component we are having is just the, one of the unintended consequences. The intended purpose of the subsidy is to improve the, the, 
the smallholder farmer productivity and it's achieving that cost. So the best we can do with nutrition is to take advantage of what it's, what the subsidies contribution, contributing nutrition, hit on that, complement it with good health care quality, and then let's spar the high forage. But its main purpose of the subsidy is to improve city of farmer productivity, and it's doing that purpose very well, both from administrative and uh, empirical literature. It's doing very well that job. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Martin. One more question to you. Yeah. So maybe this is the last round that uh, we are going to. It's a question from Abel. Okay. So uh, did you conduct equity impacts? Who benefited mostly from the input subsidy program and who did not? And what is the overlap of this group with quality of healthcare? Okay. Now, from, for, for the, the, the greatest beneficiaries of the subsidy, our data shows that uh, it's mostly farmers who are in uh, very remote areas. Unfortunately, these are the people who, whose uh, health care isn't as good as those in the urban areas. So there's an intersection of those farmers who are not, not in a so remote area, which they have uh, some good amount of exposure to good health care, and they have good amount of exposure to the subsidy. That's the subsection of the population which is benefiting most from the, in terms of nutrition for the subsidy. The extremes are suffering. Those who are in complete towns, they are not really experiencing what, what we are looking for. And those who are in complete remote areas are not experiencing. But those in between are the ones benefiting most with respect to nutrition, that is. So that's what I can answer with respect to that question. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for uh, answering these questions. I, are there any questions uh, from the participants as uh, uh, spray loaded or just now? Uh, so Halle, can you please help in that regard? Are there any questions? I don't see anything. We're also at the end of our time. So maybe just one or two more questions, if there are. If you have a final question, you can feel free to drop it in the chat box, please. Yeah, to the participants, if you have any questions still that you can please drop them in the uh, chat box so we can uh, go for last moment questions. It looks like we have another question in the chat box, Dr. Alam. Uh, yes, I can see one, two. I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's to whom? It's, it's double it's, 45 sol. It's to, uh, yes, it's to uh, Surya. Is double 45 salt a good idea given the issue of uh, NCDS? Should it be low sodium salt? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question, Sunita. Um, I think when we are trying to um, use salt as a medium, as a vehicle for fortification, this question always comes up, especially given the rise in non-communicable diseases in contexts like India. Um, we are not, when uh, the formulation of DFS that's used in UP, um, it's done in such a way that uh, the normal, the typical amount of salt that a family consumes is enough for them to receive the iron. So the recommendation from the program is not to consume more salt. Um, so I think that has to be really made clear when we um, use salt or uh, such mediums for fortification, especially to address micronutrient deficiency. I hope Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Soroti Sairiak is still the last questions to you. It's a question from Clement Aghun uh, Kunle. What can be the author ascribed to the non adherence of uh, double fortified salt in their diet? Could it be coloration or fear of adopting new culinary method or perhaps communal meats? Um, all of the above. <laughs> so, um... 
I'm just reading the question again. Uh, could it be discoloration? Yes, some of the uh, caregivers found the darkness in food uh, to be unappetizing or they were embarrassed to share, share the food uh, prepared with DFS with relatives or guests. Um, so that is one reason. And then the other is when the program recommended uh, caregivers to use DFS, they asked um, um, all the caregivers to add salt to the cooking pot only after the cooking was done. And this was difficult to adopt because everybody's used to their way of cooking. So adding salt, waiting to add salt right at the end of cooking was not feasible for some people. And there were also communi community myths. Um, there were uh, uh, some fears about this being uh, intended to be uh, a, um, a contraceptive method. Um, you know, it was also because of the lack of complete awareness. Um, so maybe that awareness boosting can address a lot of these myths. So all of the above, short answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Saruti Syriac. Maybe this was our last questions and thank you. So uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to all the speakers that there were so many questions then you answered. And then uh, I hope that many of the questions are really very valuable. Uh, and then maybe you will be able to address many of the questions uh, in your research. So now uh, we move to the uh, to closing the sessions uh, in our case. But before closing, just I want to mention a short brief like uh, the public spending, treasury spending for targeted group of poor farmers or consumers or food insecure people could bring sometimes the positive impact or effects if it is carefully designed and also combined with the uh, uh, complementary nutritional intervention uh, and that ultimately contribute to the nutritional outcomes such as for example uh, meeting up the anemia deficiency and then the child nutrition for example like height for age and so on so having said that I want to thanks to all the presenters and all the participants for presenting and then uh, participating in the Q&A sessions. Uh, there are so many very, very good questions, relevant questions. So I want to, I want to thank to, to all the participants in this session. Uh, but finally, also, I would like to gentle remind that uh, you can access all the materials, uh, for example, like the the presentations, uh, uh, then the abstract and slides uh, on the A, A, on the A and H website. So, given said that, I want to close uh, the session. Thank you, thank you so much for participating. But also want to mention that if you want to join the hangout sessions, there will be a social program, so you can join. It's uh, it will be at uh, eight fifteen. It's already eight fifteen time. 